In this edition of Dr. Dave's Diversions, we're going to repair this Honeywell branded portable electronically controlled oil filled radiator that simply doesn't turn on anymore. And we're going to use techniques that I learned from the retro community on YouTube to do so. Meanwhile, I'm going to ask you the question, was this thing designed to fail? So stick around. This is Dave. Welcome back to the channel. In this episode, we're going to look at this uh, Honeywell oil-filled portable radiator uh, that's electronically controlled. Mm -hmm. I happen to come into the possession of it uh, having a lunch with a friend. About 90% uh, of the way through our lunch, he goes, Hey, Dave, out in the car, I brought something for you to look at. And, uh, and it's, it was this, uh, this radiator. And, and what he said was, what all that happened was that they had had this, uh, well, from the date on it, I can see since 2011. And they liked the device and it worked well to heat a cool bedroom. But uh, when they moved to a new house, it simply just didn't turn on afterwards. So when he said that, I thought, well, these devices usually have safety um, you know, components in them to keep them from uh, to, to shut them off if, in case they're unsafe and jostle, getting jostled around during a move is the sort of thing that would be like the device falling over and maybe just one of these simple safety interlocks is what's the problem. So I said, sure, I'll take it home in here. You can see it in my, you know, in my cave in the basement. So uh, let's take a look at it and uh, see how it's built. And uh, what I'm going to invite you to do is along the way think of, um, you know, what, what exactly we're seeing here and what might be going wrong. So to begin disassembling this device, you have to remove four Torx security screws, uh, two of them under the top, uh, a little piece of plastic that snaps off under the top, and then two on the bottom are exposed, and they look like this. Yeah. Once those screws are removed, you can take off the metal panel on the side and exposes the electrical connections to the heating element in the base of the radiator. The radiator is filled with oil. Uh, if you tip it, you can hear there's a the little air in there, too. It's jostling around, but the idea is that the right that it's con uh, it, it conducts the temperature from the heating element into the oil and it circulates around in those fins and the air can travel past so that's the way it's put together um, on the inside of that front panel is is th this wiring so it's the ac wiring uh coming up through right in the middle there you see this kind of like these silk two silver round pieces that look kind of look like bearing sets though those are uh, on a pendulum and that is the safety device that cuts the AC electricity if this thing tips over so that it presumably wouldn't be a fire hazard. So that's the first thing that I suspected. And I'm looking at it and it seemed like it was moving around okay. So you can see uh, it swings back and forth like a pendulum. So if it tips to one side or the other, um, it will disconnect the power. I think it's, the idea is that if it also, if it tipped to the end that this thing wouldn't stay on its end, it would have to fall the other direction. So this would shut it off. But it turns out, despite that, uh, that's what other owners of this particular radiator found was the problem when it wouldn't turn on anymore, that they just needed to bend or adjust that uh, pendulum a little bit. Uh, that is not the problem with this one. So, so digging a little bit deeper, here what I've done is removed um, a, the larger white piece of plastic that's part of the um, the facade or the front, the front of the device. And then that smaller white device there is a self-contained controller unit. And you can see the AC wiring going into there. So let's look at that controller unit a little deeper. It's just mounted to the other pieces of ABS plastic uh, with these self-tapping screws. And you can see that it had snaps and we can just snap it open. When we snap it open, we see that silver uh, uh, plate in there. That's an insulating plate between the AC and DC boards in this controller. Uh, you can see that there's a pair, there's a uh, some wires coming across that have insula extra insulation around them. Those are the two conductors for the thermistor for the device to know what the temperature is in the room. And they're just insulated more from heat here so that they work properly. Uh, this is the, the AC board in it. You can see two relays in the lower left. Those are the ones that the electronic control switches to turn uh, uh, the, AC, the full mains AC um, electricity off on and off to the uh, heating element. The, another portion of this is to produce the DC power for the electronic control. And here's the back of the electronic control board. 
at first glance looks okay. Let's dig a little deeper and see what's going on here. So looking at the device, we can see that, uh-oh, when I turn it in the light just a certain way, you can see that the PCB is cracked. So let's take a closer look at that. So here's the PCB from the uh, non the side that doesn't that doesn't face the user. This is the back the back side of it, and there's a bunch of surface mount devices. You can see where there's a dual inline package I see that runs the thing in the bot the bottom there. But the crack uh, starts in this picture on the far left, goes across six traces across a ground uh, portion of it between a couple traces, and then up and to the right in this picture. Uh, past a resistor th through where one of the micro switches is mounted and terminates before it hits the other edge of the board. So it wasn't completely loose, but it is definitely bent. And this is again the, the side away from the user. So, and look at here's the front side of the board uh, where the controls are, and, and this is the non trace side. So, this is the good things are this is just a single sided uh, board, it only has traces on one side. This is the component side and the, so the solder. Is, uh, the solder they're soldered all on the back side of it. You can see uh, the controls here. Uh, the bottom one is the power switch. The one on the left, it, the two pair of micro switches on the left are up and down for the level of power that the, that the device is using to heat. And the middle pair of micro switches is to adjust the amount of time that, the, that it will stay on in hours. Um, and then the one on the right is to adjust the temperature up and down in either Fahrenheit or Celsius, which you said immediately when you turn it on. And then it has two, uh, seven segment, two seven segment uh, LEDs, which will show a temperature, or if you are adjusting the level, it'll show bars that are the number of the level that you're at or the number of hours. In this picture, you can see uh, at the top is the part that covers those LEDs, it's just a little window to pass them through. Uh, and then there's three gray pairs of contacts, plastic contacts for the paddles that come in contact with the micro switches. And at the bottom, you see the, uh, the on off switch. So now that we see that what the problem is, uh, I decided let's dive in and repair this, uh, you know, again, using techniques that I've learned from repairing old computers on YouTube. So let's go to the bench and I'll show you what I did. So here we are with the controller board for that electronically controlled radiator. And this is after I have done a series of repairs on it. I just want to give you an idea of what's involved. So what happened was there's the crack. Um, it terminated right there, came through this edge, went along there. And the center of the pressure for the that caused the crack was this top micro switch. So there's a paddle shaped switch on the front of the radiator that got apparently struck hard. It plowed into that micro switch causing it to not work anymore it didn't have that you know clickiness um there anymore so i desoldered that and and bought some new ones 22 cents a piece from um, digikey and put that in there but anyway the crack went all the way through there it it was pretty straightforward and that it, it went across these six traces um then went through here across this ground so that doesn't matter through this trace under a surface mount resistor uh, through that trace, but there were two adjacent resistors. So that was an easy repair to just bridge across the two resistors um, and, and, uh, and, and fix that. And then it went under that switch that broke. And uh, so I soldered the new one on there. This is just a drill stop um, or stop drill hole to keep it from cracking further if pressure is put on it again. So if we look at the front panel of it, this is going to face the front panel of the device and have, you know, label um, switches over it and a, 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 a more presentable face. This would read the temperature and settings. But what I've done is across the bottom of the crack, I found a piece of, you know, just extra plastic that I broke off. It was a piece of uh, a Leviton uh, thing that you would stick like RJ45 jacks in. And these were covers for empty spots in that. So it was just pieces of plastic that were flat that I could uh, attach to that with JB weld, plastic weld. So um, those are just welded on there. While it was drying, I had that clipped together and I tried to get it pretty flat. It's not exactly flat. There's a little bit of curve to this PCB, but that's okay. I mean, it was always getting pressure on the front anyway, but it is very rigid now.
with those three pieces in place, you can't flex that crack anymore. So that's how I fixed it physically. Now, what did we do electronically or electrically? Well, um, the crack, you know, went from here to here. So as you can imagine, let's zoom in a little bit. Uh, as you can imagine, most of the work was down in this area here. There's six traces of varying widths that were all very close to each other and all cracked through. So I used an X-Acto knife, you know, uh, and uh, scraped away the solder mask in every place I was going to do a repair to expose the copper there. And once the copper was exposed, I tinned it up with my, um, with my uh, soldering iron and uh, some lead-based solder. And then I used the technique that I learned from Bruce on Bracus, Bracus Creations site. I'll link that video here. Um, but uh, I mean, the technique is to take uh, enameled uh, uh, magnet wire and very carefully with tweezers, I used these kind of scissor like tweezers, hold it in place very steadily, and then use the point of the soldering iron to draw more solder across it and solder each one of those magnet wires, melting or burning the enamel coating off and, and soldering them to either side of the crack. And then uh, I did a little bit of cleanup at the end, uh, just dragging a hot iron across it to make it look nice. And then, of course, I had to test it out and make sure that every one of them had continuity now across the crack. And more, more probably as important or more, none of them have continuity to the adjacent trace. So to make sure there was no solder bridge created there. Um, similarly, there's the patch between those two resistors that has a piece of magnet wire in there too. This crack over here, even though it looks like a big solder blob, there is also a uh, piece of magnet wire in there. And those are the four pins that are the bottom of one of these micro switches. Uh, just a, it's just a momentary uh, single pole, single throw sort of micro switch. So uh, the only thing left to do uh, uh, that I think I want to do before I reassemble it on the blind faith that this is going to work um, is I'm going to use some nail polish and cover those up so we don't get any corrosion on the copper traces that I exposed just because I don't have um, whatever the green solder mask stuff. So we'll do that um, and then we'll put it back together and see how we did. So now that we, we've, we've, uh, done, we've effected a repair uh, on the board, uh, let's jump ahead and uh, have everything reassembled and see how it's working. Uh, now that I've prepared the board, it does turn on. And uh, this means it's that the third, the, the highest level of its power. Um, it thinks that in the room it's 76 degrees right now. We can adjust the temperature. So right now it says um, we have it set to 70, so it shouldn't be on. If we turn it up to... Uh, 80. You shouldn't hear it come on, I guess. And we heard the relay go. So it should be heating on its high setting. Um, this one that adjusts the three levels of how intensely it'll heat, how many watts, it's, it seems to be stuck on the 1500 watt one. The med it doesn't go down to the medium level nor the lower level, which is 600 watts. All right, so we fixed a lot of it but still there's one of the controls that's not working. So let's take a look at why that might be. So a uh, quick cut to disassemble everything again. We're back uh, looking at the bottom side of that controller board here. And you can see in the middle of this, there are two sets of four contacts. That's where the two micro switches are that control the power level that is not working. And you can see in this photo that I've removed one of the resistors above it and cleaned the pads. So what I decided is where the crack through, it must have broken that resistor. I couldn't determine that the resistor wasn't working by testing it in circuit, and it's just an SMD resistor. So in the process of removing it, it's essentially destroyed. Um, so, uh, so what are we going to do with that? Well, here's the sideways version of, of the where the solder pads are clean. You can see the number 10 is written right under it. That was 10K. I just scratched it a little bit. But this is the designer of the board's uh, notes saying what values of resistors should be there. You see 470, 10K, and 10K. Well, they did not have a 10K there. They had a 4.7K, 
and but uh, but I have 10 K's on hand I don't have 4.7 K's on hand so what I do did is just uh, this and I soldered a, uh, a through hole resistor to those pads that I cleaned and I put a little sticky tack at the other end to hold it in place while I was soldering it and by that I mean um, it's actually uh, rope caulk like I just keep some of this uh, this rope caulk around to, to uh, tack things down and in this case I decided to leave it there uh, I painted the the contacts over again with um, with the with the nail polish but uh, that this should be somewhat heat resistant not for super high heat but that can just stay in there so I left it there so uh, let's try it again and uh, see how it works out this time before assembling it and we'll just run it with the controller here all right great so uh, we, we got the device back working I reassembled it it's working like a champ now and uh, now let's think a little bit about what was going on uh, with uh, this device. So that was a fun bit of sleuthing. Uh, and I, I did a little more digging into, you know, uh, uh, what this device is and how it came to be. Uh, th this one is manufactured by this company, called, or sold, I should say, rather, by Kaz USA. It's, uh, you know, manufactured abroad. And then they licensed the Honeywell name. So this is like a, a pretty typical situation today, right? You take a trusted brand name, more than 100 years old, that was in the, um, doing uh, heating in addition to many other things that Honeywell did, but a brand that's recognizable where Kaz isn't. And then they designed this device. And so, this is, so the problem here was something to do with the way that it could take an impact from the front and it could damage something precious. So think of the way that this device is built. If we look at it here, what we're seeing is that the housing is ABS plastic. It is really strong. And this thing could fall over on its face. That ABS is not going to be a problem. But what protrudes most from it is those buttons. Like I'm showing here and pointing at that button, you can see that those buttons on the front protrude further than the ABS plastic that's meaning to protect the components inside. And we saw from taking apart the device that it's basically those switches are a direct path to the micro switches, which are delicate, and the PCB, which is fragile. So an impact to those buttons on the front outside the ABS plastic will go right through the multiple layers of ABS plastic and smash that board. So that was the design issue here. Um, and then, uh, and, and it's an, you know, an industrial designer or something that's responsible for doing such a thing. Now, I said this one was 11 years old. Um, here's the way the device uh, looks today. So, so if, you buy a, if you buy this equivalent model today, look at the difference. The buttons no longer protrude past the ABS bezel, that, that's the housing that goes around it. So that's definitely an improvement. But uh, in this case, uh, my, you know, my friend uh, bought it before they had done that design change and the warranty is five years and it's out of warranty. So, uh, so anyway, they've improved the product. Anyway, that's what we have uh, for this, this time. I really enjoyed this project. I, I really think it's great that YouTubers like Bruce um, over at Brackets Creations you know, t indirectly taught me how to do repairs like this. And it's how you can take things that you learn like with retro computing and fix appliances for folks and hopefully they won't be asking you to fix my radio as often as they say fix my computer. So take care. See you next time.